So unfortunately, we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully, we'll be back with you shortly. And let us try that all again with feeling. We do apologize for the very clear attack of the gremlins that we had. I did try and say good morning to everybody around the world and I did the whole introduction spiel and we went through all of it but we're going to do that once more. Try this again with feeling. My name is JV and this morning I have Gert on camera with me. Steph is out with Jandre and we are following up on Lion Calls. Now, I'm not sure how much of my earlier introduction you managed to see but um, there's going to be a few tired faces in the Wild Earth team this morning due largely to a nocturnal elephant visitor that decided to do some reshaping of the, the, the trees around the camp as well as the gate. So all of us feeling a little bit tired, having been kept awake by elephants wandering about. I had one in the garden where I live. The people at the DRC had one in their camp, or two in their camp. Now why are the lion tracks going this way now? I'm so confused. Tracking lions, by the way, you would have heard them calling on the Juma Dam camera. Oh no, you wouldn't have, sorry. You wouldn't have heard them calling on the Juma Dam camera because that's down for repairs. But the lion tracks are now going the other way. Mm. No, but these are not fresh. These are not nearly as fresh as the ones that we're following. So they were roaring on the dam wall first thing this morning. Looks from the tracks as though it is a mating pair of lions. It's that mating pair again. And we're going to try and see if we can't figure out exactly where it is they've wandered off to. Taxon is helping me out in terms of the search to see whether or not... I know he is, he's been trying the whole of yesterday as well to try and find these lions. So hopefully they don't give us the slip. They've disappeared into a very thick drainage line area. Now the lioness that is mating has suckle marks and the question is whether or not it is postpartum estrus in other words basically her hormones confusing the male or the potential that she has lost her cubs the biggest problem now is that that male has been refusing to let her leave to go back if if she does still have her cubs he's been he won't have let her leave to go and feed them and I'm sure that's where she's desperately been trying to go if she does have cubs still alive. A very, very tricky situation and an unintentional act on the male's part might actually result in the death of those cubs. Okay, lions were all over here but not fresh. Let us figure out what's happening here. No, these are fresh. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Steph. I've just picked up on the Mont Buffles, a cut line going east, the tracks that is. Okie dokie. Steph's also picked up on tracks for the Lion Pride. They've crossed south towards our area. So. Where are these lions? Because the male was clearly roaring from around there. Let's go back and around. <laughs> and Justin, I did find Fluffy Pom Pom Hat. Uh, but Fluffy Pom Pom Hat, actually I didn't. Louise did. She found it in the Mahindra. Uh, so Fluffy Pom Pom Hat has been relocated. Brent's name has been cleared. He has once again been falsely accused of stealing my, something of mine, but he didn't. Uh, it was me. I left it in one of our other vehicles. Unfortunately, fluffy pom-pom hat doesn't look so fluffy anymore. It looks bedraggled and dirty. So before it can resume its spot on my head, I have to give it a little bit of a clean. So while I go off in fierce search of these lions to help Steph out, let's jump on the back with him so he can say his good mornings once again. Good morning once again after that little short sojourn away from us. Uh, we decided that we'd leave that, that leopard, uh, the site of that old leopard kill. There wasn't too much going on over there. So we've 
decided to come around the back of Juma right now, back of house. And lo and behold, we picked up some lion tracks. I think it's the same tracks that Jamie is trailing. It looks like more than one or two. It looks like a young pride or a small pride, not a young pride, I should say. And, um, and moving towards the camp, moving towards the Galago Pan side of the lodge. Are we just, you caught us just cruising basically at walking pace through here. And the reason for that is I don't quite know where they're going to be crossing out from. Out of the block that's off to our right hand side. They're inside here at the moment. That's at least what I predict. That's where their tracks are going. Relatively fresh tracks from this morning. And apart from the elephant trashing our camp, we had bushbuck alarm calling probably around about 2 o'clock this morning. And right up until 4 o'clock, there was lions roaring around the camp. So they, they're somewhere around here. Now in the middle of that tree, you're looking at is a... Right up a little bit is a leopard orchid. And quite a big one, in actual fact, and quite healthy. I mean, for a tree that's suspended in the air like that, to get that big, you're looking at a, at a tree that's at least 35 to 40 years old, or a plant at least, that's at least 35 to 40 years old. Leopard orchid, and then off to the right-hand side of that, we've got what's left of the full moon, the waning full moon. I think it was full probably yesterday or the day before, although it was... Up pretty high yesterday, Jean-André says. Up pretty high with the rising sun this morning. A bit hazy at the moment. We've been treated to a beautiful sunrise with this diffused light that's coming through. And it seems like it's quite dusty. And definitely not an uncommon characteristic around this time of the year. With these winds that pick up around the cold fronts that sweep across the land, we quite often get no rain and then this dust, this fine white dust that gets kicked up into the atmosphere. And it's the combination of the rain and the wind and the extreme dry surface uh, of the earth that starts to pull this moisture up from deep down in the earth's surface or deep down in the earth's crust, starts pulling this moisture up along a moisture gradient, and it's that that gives the trees with the deepest roots the first little bit of moisture to kick out their flowers. And that will happen in the next, I presume, by between the 10th and the 15th of August. We're going to be seeing our first trees flowering here. And the trees that flower first, our summertime trees here, are the knobthorn, the tree wisteria, the weeping boer bean, the shambok pod, mm. And they start flowering, that's about it that I can think of right now. And they start flowering straight after the aloes have finished. The aloes flower in June and July. And as soon as the dip happens with the aloes, then all of a sudden we start getting our springtime coming. It's not spring until, for me at least anyway, the 1st of September. But we do get trees flowering here as early as sort of the 10th of August, the 15th of August. I can't wait. Summertime for me is definitely the best time of the year with my two favorite months being January and May. And the reason why I enjoy January is just the profusion of life and the vibrance of the bush is at its peak in January for me. And it's just the diversity of what can be found around these places is just absolutely phenomenal. And I enjoy May again because the heat of summer has started to dissipate. And the grass is starting to lie flat and animals are starting to congregate around the water sources. Still a lot of grass around and you get these lovely sort of misty mornings. And, uh, and these quite chilly afternoons, but without having to dress up like an Eskimo like I'm at the moment. Alright, now while I was sitting over there listening and we were watching that leopard orchid basking in the sun, we... Uh, I thought to myself that we'd actually go and have a look on the other side of camp. The tracks seem to be going south from here. And although it would be a good idea to actually follow on those tracks, it's a far better idea to try and intuitively guess where the tracks are most likely to come out and work from a forward, basically a forward position backwards rather than always following up. These animals can sometimes move quite incredible distances at night time. And even from when we last heard the last roar around the camp around 4 o'clock to now, 
They can move two, three kilometers from where we are. It doesn't sound too far. It isn't that far in actual fact. But they could quite easily cross a boundary depending on what, uh, on what direction they go in, without a doubt. So. Been a lot of cat action around the property over the last couple of nights, last couple of days. We've had different sets of lions on the property. We've had mating lions on the property. We've had leopards on kills. We've got Karula somewhere with her two youngsters, evidenced by tracks that we found yesterday afternoon. And Karula is a, a dominant female leopard in this area. We haven't seen her for quite some time. So there's a lot of action, and this sometimes happens. Action. Animal action on a, on, a, on a property waxes and wanes and you sometimes find these massive collections, you don't know what to do with yourself, there's just so much choice and then at other times, as I'm sure some of the long term viewers can attest to, you end up driving around here for days and days without seeing too much. Let's see if we can show you this crested spur fell, it's a male crested spur fell. And I'm hoping that he comes out into the open there for you. Yeah, come on. There you go. That male crested spur fell. You can see the spurs on his feet. And just as he crests over the top, Jamie has got a hippo that's out of the water for you. Well, we, we sort of had a hippo out of the water at Buffles Hook Dam. There he goes there. He's going to disappear very quickly. But there you go. A hippo continuing on this chilly morning. He doesn't have to rush back into the dam itself. So he's going to be still foraging and feeding while he still can. And we're seeing the hippo out of the water more and more. First of all, that's normal for this time of year. And second of all, because of the drought, they need to make use of as much time out uh, spent feeding as possible. Oh, and we've got a lovely heron in the water. Let's just stop for one moment. Looks like a grey heron, although I'm staring straight into the sun. I can tell you as well that the tracks of the pride came from Buffleshook Dam itself. Oh, there you go. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely lovely. A grey heron, currently wandering through the b what remains of the Buffleshook Dam, fishing and trying to figure out. Uh, cause you could just imagine how cold his legs must be feeling right now in this dam. I shiver at the thought. Our taxes come through here as well to Buffleshook Dam to try and follow up on the mail line tracks that we had moving in this direction. I can tell you, as I said, that the pride came from here, which doesn't really help us, does it? Because you don't really want to know where they came from. We want to know where they've gone and try and figure out if we can't find them somewhere around there. But I think they've probably been hunting in the middle of that very thick block around the Wool Road. Hopefully Step will follow up there. I'm going to make my way slowly back towards that area and figure out, and see if I can't give him a hand with that. And for now, it's a very peaceful scene at the Buffles Hook Dam. There's a blacksmith lapwing also wading about and finding whatever he can in the shallows. Freshwater mollusks as well. There he is there on the edge of the water. Okay, now if we go back, we've got a lovely view of our blacksmith lapwing, but if we go back to our heron for a moment, um, Blobbit McBlob, forgive me if I've got your name wrong, but that's, I'm pretty sure what it was. Blobbit McBlob, yes, it is the same heron as you get in your area, the grey heron. Oh, there he goes. 
giving us a fantastic demonstration of his flying ability. Oh, there you go. We didn't... Oh, off into the rising sun. That's beautiful. Well done, Gert. Yes, it is the same heron as you guys get in... Um, well, I'm not actually sure, Blobbit McBlob, where you are from, but this, this is a heron species that is incredibly widespread. So it is a, a heron that you would encounter in the UK and in Europe. And if you are from those areas, then it is the same bird. Here's our blacksmith lapwing, wading about with his long toes to stop him sinking too deeply into the mud. And as I said, I shiver at the thought, although perhaps the, wa the water's actually a little bit warmer, being soaking up the rays of the sun all day. Hmm, what has Tax picked up upon? Let me just chat to Tax quickly. Tax, Tax. Tax, I picked up in Konzo and Bufelsuk west of Ngala going out. I think it's the same one that Steph had tracks for go crossing south at Timbuti Dam. But there wasn't a daughter with them. I wonder if he didn't meet up with them. <laughs> Copy that. The, yeah, those in Konzo looked fresh on Buffalo West. Uh, going east. Yeah, uh, sorry, going west. Oh, Taxon and I, both of us getting our east and our west confused this morning. Maybe Taxon also got kept up by an elephant last night. Sorry guys, I am going to have to be on the Game Drive channel, but luckily for you, Steph has managed to not find a lion, but to find something much taller. And there we have a beautiful male giraffe coming up through the woodland from the drainage line. He doesn't look like he's too relaxed. He might be charging us though. No, I'm only joking. You can see that he's wandering around, just literally looking for branches. Although he's keeping a good eye into that drainage line there. Tracks of those lions disappear into this drainage line. I'm wondering if he hasn't seen them. No, he's just busy feeding on those bushes. Not the largest giraffe I've ever seen, but definitely... Quite a full-grown male giraffe. You can see by, by his horns, the ossification on his horns is quite robust. And I actually think that he's probably just quite a skinny giraffe rather than a giraffe that's, that's tiny. I can imagine that they're losing a bit of condition this time of the year. Leaves this year haven't been in the great abundance. I can actually see another giraffe a little bit further back as well. Quite often, just like teenagers though, that are coming to the end of their teen years, they all bandy with, with their bodies looking almost too big for, for, for their bone structure that's underneath. And that I think is exactly what's happening here, is we're having a look at some young male giraffe, mature male giraffe, but without the bulk of a bull, of a bull in, in his prime. Now how I knew from a distance that this was a male giraffe is the tops of those horns that you can see have no hair on. Females have a tufted horn. It's a little bit more delicate than those horns. And they of course use not a true horn. Giraffes are born with those horns. They're called ossicones. They're lying flat against the skull and then they, they bounce upright soon after birth and then they fuse to the skull and they use those horns to fight one another. They use their head as a bit of a, a mace and swing it around on their long necks generating some incredible force that they use then to bash their opponent's legs and necks. And it does result, it can result in some quite nasty injuries for giraffe. Um, I've seen them fall onto the road and onto, onto the ground after having been knocked down. And 
contrary to common belief, and my experience at least anyway, a giraffe that fall down don't necessarily generate enough momentum in their heads to smack themselves unconscious on the ground. The theory behind it, of course, is that such a long neck doesn't have the musculature attached to it to stop a whipping motion from developing if the giraffe suddenly falls. But I must be honest, I've never seen that. I've seen giraffe lying down, I've seen them fall down. And I've never seen that whipping motion take effect. Now they're obviously browsers, which means that they just eat leaves, they don't eat grass at all. With male giraffe, there's and there's the other male giraffe coming through the the trees. Another male I see because of that bald horn on the top. A little bit darker than the first one. You can see that he's almost black when you correspond the colors together. You see that he's got some very dark patches. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the one is older than the other. You do get blonder giraffe and you do get darker giraffe as well. And they'll get a little bit darker with age but generally speaking they born a certain hue and then just darken from there. The giraffe looks like he's going to cross right behind our vehicle. Now, Terry Steele, good morning Terry. You've asked do lions ever attack giraffe? Absolutely. Lion definitely enjoy eating giraffe. Have a look at how majestic that looks. I just find giraffe being possibly one of the most bizarre creatures on this earth crossing right behind the vehicle that's the aerial mount that you've got in view there and of course the giraffe will stop exactly there <laughs> having a look at us have a look at how giant he is compared to us just swinging you through the arc we can't do a full 360 in our cameras and there he stops again definitely a full-grown male giraffe, you can do with a little bit more bulk, probably another 20 or 30 percent. But a giraffe in his prime nonetheless. Standing a good five and a half meters tall, uh, five and a half meters is probably about 15 to 17 feet off of the ground. And the tallest land mammal on the planet at the moment. sails off into the distance there. I just find giraffe, as I just mentioned, one of the most bizarre creatures. Imagine coming to Africa for the first time and seeing a giraffe. Let me see if I can reverse a little bit. Seeing a giraffe for the first time and having to go back and explain it to your colleagues at the Royal Geographical Society about, you saw this animal that was stretched vertically, looking a little bit like a camel, and a little bit like nothing that you have ever seen before. There's that darker giraffe. You can see he's almost got whiter fur with those darker blotches. And Jamie has just asked me, what did giraffe use their horns for? Jamie, they use their horns for fighting. They will, those horns are designed to maximize pressure over a small surface area and create enough to knock an opponent to the ground. So when giraffe are fighting for the attentions of a female, they will, and you have two giraffe of similar size, they will stand off with one another and after a bit of pushing, after a little bit of pushing each other, they generally jostle with their shoulders. What will happen is they start swinging their necks around using their heads as a mace with a hope that they can dominate their opponent and get him to give up and in that way prove their fitness and their virility and their strength to a female in the hope that she chooses him. Let's go forward a little bit so we can get a view of him again. See, they're now feeding around our car, these two male giraffe. 
see if we can get us into a nice position. Quite nice where we are at the moment. There's some impala around us. Got these giraffe birds. See if we can get you a nice view. Ah. I think on that note, let's see if we can get you. While we find a nice position to go into, I'm going to pass you over to Jamie, who I think has been quite lucky this morning. And here we go. We have our lions to the east of Buffles Hook Dam. They were right up close to where we stopped earlier to have a look at that heron. There's actually four lionesses here. However, we have to make do with this view for now. The reason behind that is we are right next to the den site where the new set of Nkuhuma cubs is hiding out. Now, mom is with them at the moment feeding, and the rest of the lionesses have moved closer to her. And for that reason, because Andrew was the one who found them, he is currently in that position, and therefore we because of those cubs are so young we're not going to go any closer for now we're going to leave Andrew to his view and we will wait our turn to head across and have a slightly different angle on the sighting now because the cubs are so young we are staying here with this particular lioness until we have an opportunity to move in hmm that prominent line prominent ridge down the back of her neck all lionesses, of course, have that. But I've noticed that Amber Eyes, her ridge down the center of her head and down the back of her neck is particularly prominent. Oh, that might be Amber Eyes. Is can hear cubs. Oh. Yes, there are cubs in this in this sighting, but they're behind they're behind the lioness, or they're on the other side of the lioness, in the drainage line itself. Who have we got here? Look up, girl. She's giving herself a thorough cleaning. I wonder where the Inkahumas have been hiding since we last saw them hunting. They were hunting on oh it is amber eyes. Hey, how's that? That's awesome to realize. Guys, I've got to move. Um, just let Taxon pass. Bear with me one moment. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. This is a bit of a confusing sighting because there's several females all moving around and about. Now just bear with me a moment. as we shift out of the way for tax to come through. We were completely blocking his path. Thanks, Tax. Okay. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. Let us try and reposition. Oh, where is going to be the best spot for us for now? I just saw another female walking towards her. Now, I only counted four when we first came in here. So that might mean that that other female is still with the male. There were tracks of both of them on quarantine. Let's just see where Amber Eyes goes. Oof, this is very tricky. We are just going to have to wait our turn. She's going to make her way further in to the block. Yeah, no, she's disappearing for now. Going to meet up with one of the other lionesses. But for now, we have to content ourselves with a, well, basically a non-view at this point and just wait our turn. I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually, my beanie's making its way up my head. I'm actually going to leave this sighting for now, I think. Let me try one more time to get us a view. I think otherwise we're going to leave the sighting, wait for the other vehicles to move out, and then we can actually make our way in. There's three lionesses in there, but it's really very tricky. And I don't want to go in off-road. 
in through that gap there. I don't want to go in off road without or while there are other vehicles on the other side of the drainage. You might have a view through that gap. Um, a little bit to the or maybe you don't have a view to the right. Sorry, Khat. There you are. There she is on the right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There's both of them. Wonderful. I wonder if they managed to catch anything. They were looking particularly hungry when we last saw them. Well, hopefully they did. It looks as though they... It's interesting because we're, their tracks were heading in a completely different direction. It was just sort of sheer instinct that kept me checking around Buffelsook Dam area rather than actually thinking we were going to find them because their tracks were going east, uh, going west towards quarantine. And yet here we find them in the complete opposite direction. So they were probably very busy hunting last night. And it looks as though they haven't been successful. That was greeted with impatience, unusually so for lionesses. Perhaps that's a, one of the females with cubs and just didn't appreciate having her personal space invaded. She's probably had to deal with it plenty. No, it's not, an, it's not at all. She's not a lioness with cubs. I wonder where the older set are. She, I think she's making her way in towards them. Uh, Justin S, on the subject of our on the subject of our lionesses and hunting, Justin was wondering about whether or not when a lion eats it chews its food or if it just bites off small pieces. And it that's essentially what it does. They don't really spend all that much time chewing their food. What they do is they use the carnassial shear that is formed by their molars. So basically their molars are like giant pairs of scissors that slice through the, through the meat itself. But as you said, they do cut off or bite off small chunks and they don't bother taking the time to chew. Which makes sense. It's for all of our predators to eat as quickly as possible is the best possible approach to survival. And the reason behind that is of course because they never know whether or not they're going to manage to keep that meal or if it is going to be stolen from them at some point. So absolutely, the, the lionesses will grab, or the lions will grab a bite of meat, swallow it, and carry on. And their digestive systems are built to cope with that. So they've got incredibly robust digestive systems, not quite to the extent that a hyena does. A hyena's stomach acid is one of the most potent acids in the world. That's why you get that fine, grainy look to their scat. A lion's not quite so powerful, but they do just gulp down small bones, bits of hoof, um, and bits of fur, which is why you'll often find shards of it in their scat, shards of bone and hoof. And what often happens is actually they can block up their stomachs that way, and then they get ill for a couple of days, and then they vomit it back up again. So if you ever find lion vomit, you very, very frequently, apart from all of the tapeworms and various other in intestinal parasites that you'll find. You'll also find that there's a lot of bone and hoof in that sort of thing. Uh, they don't take time to chew their food in the way that we would. And déjà vu from Jamaica while we watch our hooded vulture who is lurking around the lionesses, I think in hope of scoring a bit of a meal from them. Vultures very often follow behind lionesses in order to scavenge, or to, in order to see whether or not they make a kill. But I apologize if I am getting your name wrong. You are from Jamaica, and, was, and you were wondering whether or not lions eat meat only. Yes, they're obligate carnivores. They... <laughs> this vulture is definitely playing the patience game. They will only eat meat, as will vultures. So what they will do is they will 
occasionally eat a little bit of grass, some vegetation. They might chew that in the same way dogs and cats do when they're feeling ill, but that's purely to make themselves vomit or bring up whatever it is that's blocking their digestive system. Otherwise, other than that, they are entirely obligate carnivores. Their digestive systems are built to deal with meat only. That's not to say if they happen to find, um, I don't know, some, some form of carbohydrate, they might nibble on it, but it's definitely a thoroughly meat-based diet. Sorry, guys, I'm just checking carefully from the side just to see whether or not there's any sign of them. And speaking of our lions and their diet, Teddy Gonzalez, at about six weeks old, the cub's digestive system and their teeth are ready and well developed enough for them to start eating meat. But they, at that point, it will only really be the odd nibble around a carcass. It's it's only at about two and a half, two to two and a half months that they start eating meat properly, and around three months, three to four months that they are weaned. I wonder where our older set of lion cubs are. They must be on the other side. And we'll just wait our turn to go and investigate that particular area. She's giving herself a thorough bar. So a very tricky sighting for now, guys. We will be able to get a better view at some point. But for now, we will have to content ourselves with this view. And good morning to Bill. Now, you wanted to know why the big cats don't eat the dying catfish. And I often wonder about that. The answer to that is that they do. Uh, we have got, we've seen some incredible photographs of leopards jumping into the mud and grabbing the catfish themselves. I don't know why they don't make take more advantage of it. I never understood it in the first place. When we watched the catfish struggling in the Voyatella Dam and sort of writhing on top of each other and dying, I always thought, imagined that it would be really easy pickings for a predator. My only guess is that um, perhaps they they don't like the taste, perhaps it's not worth the effort of going to to try and climb into the mud and pull them out. But I honestly don't know why it is that they don't take more advantage of it. Even the hyenas, I expected, would would scavenge off those dead and dying catfish more than they did. And I don't quite know the answer to that. My only suggestion is it's not worth it for them. But that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because, I mean, any meal is worth it for animals for whom survival is of utmost importance out here. I have absolutely no idea why it is they don't take... why it is they don't eat the big catfish. I expected them to, and what that does do is it leaves the water with the dying catfish. They start to rot, and they really start to smell particularly unpleasant. Okay, well the good news is that Steph seems to have a slightly better view of something else. I'm going to send you across and I'm going to keep it a surprise. <laughs> Alright, and our perseverance paid off. We have uh, a male lion in view. Looks to be one of the Birmingham boys. Looks like he's on a mission somewhere and we are absolutely going to be following him seeing where he's going. We're tracking him from Buffelshoek Dam, heard some impala giving alarm calls, lost his track, switched off the car and he was roaring as we switched off the car. Came down the road and we were lucky enough to spot him before he went into this thick bush. Couldn't have timed it better. If we were here literally 30 seconds later he would be in the bush and we'd be speculating as to where he went. All right, it's going to get a bit bumpy and a bit scratchy as we go through here. It's not the easiest block to drive through. And he seems to be on one of these missions that male lions get into every now and again, where they just literally walk on a vector heading somewhere. 
I don't quite know if he is the male that has been mating with that female recently. A, because I haven't seen him mating with that female, I've been off the property for a bit, and B, because I haven't been able to see his face yet. Let's see if we can get in front of him. It's going to take a little bit of creative driving on my part. Experience would tell me to literally just follow this male lion in his footsteps <clears throat> because they tend to pick the easiest ways through the bush. But in an effort to try and get around him, let me see if we can't change it up a little bit. You'll see me furiously trying to work the steering wheel. At the same time, trying not to drive into an ant bear hole or a warthog burrow. And then keeping my eye on him. Luckily for us, he's moving onto this crest, which is going to give us the chance of getting in front of him. Let's see if we can do that for you through here. He's a good sort of 50 or 60 yards away from us at the moment, so don't worry that my driving is going to be causing a disturbance to this male whatsoever. I'm very carefully monitoring his behavior. And the key when you're following cats like this is to look at their ears. If their ears are facing you, then you know absolutely that they're taking more notice of you than the bush around them. Ah, the inevitable monkey th orange thicket. All right, let's see if we can go through here. John, we might just have to lift that. Okay, this male line is literally 20 yards in front of us at the moment. <laughs> this gave us a little dirty look there as we crashing through this monkey orange thicket. One thing I can say about monkey oranges is that they're not rare. Let's see if we can give you a, a view quickly of his, of his bum. And just like I said would be the easiest going through exactly where he's been walking. All right. I think we're going to try and see if we can get in front of this male line for you. Doing this is not giving you any view whatsoever. I think it'll be better if we send you over to Jamie and try and catch up with this male. Uh, guys, just bear with me one second while Steph tries to catch up with the lines. I really need to be on the Game Drive channel in order to organize this sighting. So I'm sorry, we've left it for now. We will be back with it later. Tax, do you want to keep that area that you and Andrew are on? Do you want to keep that a two vehicle lock? Okay, copy, perfect. Um, I'm pulling out of that area for now. There's sort of one out of five visual. I know that Steph has also got Medora and Gala. I'm not sure exactly where. A from tax, but no, no rush. I'll come once you guys are done. Okay, copy that. Thanks very much, tax.
Okie dokie. I am sorry about that. So what this is basically, the radio that I'm on allows us to communicate with all of the different guides in the area. And what that means is that we can call in sightings, we can discuss whatever it is we found, we can help each other out, which is what Tex and I, and Andrew actually, all did this morning to try and find these lines for you. And then what happens is because of the because of the impact that we want to reduce on the animal, we have a certain restriction of the number of vehicles that we have in a sighting. But what we need to do is just try and control who is coming in, what the order is that you can come into a sighting, and so on and so forth. So we're going to try and approach from the other side. Andrew's going to give us his spot, and he's going to head out and find other things. So that was what was happening there, and that's why I had to be on the Game Drive channel, otherwise we might not have got a spot at the Lions. And just an update, while we are sidling forward to go across to a different view of our lionesses, we have an update, well actually this is, this is from me at 2 o'clock this morning while I was watching the elephant outside my window. I heard what I think was Tingana coming back onto Juma. Now whether or not he's still here is a different question. Hopefully he is still around, but we will. I'm also going to try and follow up on him a little bit later. We're so, as Steph said this morning on his start of his drive, we are so spoiled for choice at the moment in terms of what we're going to try and find for you that it is absolutely marvelous. And I'm waiting for the day when it changes and we go into a, a sightings drought, a dry patch. Because it just seems as though luck has well and truly been on our side. Yeah, we've got, got to make our way all the way around. And Joey? watching in Australia. Fantastic as always to have you on board with us on our sunrise safari. Yes, it's true that dogs and cats can choke on bones of things like chickens. However, no, it never happens in the wild and I'll tell you why. It's only when you cook things like chicken bones that they become brittle and they break off into shards. And that is why you can't feed your dogs or cats cooked chicken because unless it's of course off the bone but that is you can feed your dog and I, I did feed my dog Lexi on a diet of raw bones along with or to supplement her diet I did give her raw bones they're good for her teeth chicken bones when they are uncooked are rubbery so any of the bones here uncooked absolutely fine for the animals now the only way that they would run the risk of encountering something unpleasant is if they were scavenging around campsites where they might pick up a discarded chop bone or something similar. Now, as far as I know, there are no recorded cases of animals lacerating their internal organs. It's not so much the choking risk as the potential for laceration. I, I think it's just because a hyena's stomach, because generally it's the hyenas that scavenge those sorts of things, and I think their stomach acid is better equipped to deal with such scraps rather than a... An, a different to a domestic dog or a cat that's had that survival uh, or that level of digestive resilience has been bred out of them over the years. I'm just going to go through underneath the little archway and around to the sighting. Sorry guys, it's quite a long way round. But no, all bones, raw bones are absolutely fine for the animals to eat out here. Raw eggs, even raw eggshells. The animals are thoroughly equipped to deal with them. A bit of a bumpy stretch here onto the fire break. Now often we refer to the fire break and we don't necessarily explain to you exactly what it means. This fire break is cut, as the name suggests, to stop the spread of fires from one property to another. So most of the properties in this region have a road, it's, it's not kept 
in the condition that the roads are kept in, because that's not really its purpose, although we can use it for a, as a road, but it is there essentially to, to add an extra level of protection against runaway fires. Not that those are going to be a risk this year, I don't think. There's nothing to burn. Usually, this time of year, the grasses are dead and dry, but they're about this high, rather than completely absent altogether. It seems as though Steph has managed to relocate a road. Let's find out how his attempt to follow that male lion is going. <laughs> I have actually managed to relocate the road, contrary to, uh, to genre's belief that we were going to be lost in the middle of the block there for eternity. And what we've done is just as you watched us lose him, that was the last time we've actually seen him. We've now come out onto the road in the direction, there he is, <laughs> that? All right, so the idea there was to come out in, the dire in front of the direction where he, was, uh, where he was walking to, and we've managed to hopscotch in front of him, and you were lucky enough to find him as we did. So now I am in front of him. What I'm going to try and do is get you into a position where we can actually see him, and you can, I can prove to you that we have a male lion <laughs> there you go. A male line just for you. Now he's obviously heard something which has gotten his attention. That's exactly why he's been why he's walking as fast as what he is. And have a look carefully while he's busy walking. I want you to try something if you can while we're busy doing this. Watch how far in front of his front foot the back foot is placed. For those of you who follow the show religiously, you'll notice quite often we talk about a cat registering track on track. And you'll notice that in this particular case, his back foot is outstriding his front foot quite badly. And I'm going to show you now, as soon as we get in front of him one more time. Obviously, I'm not parking directly in front of him because we don't really want to stop what he's busy doing. So he's slowed down a little bit now. If we can get in front here. Watch out, Zonda. Oh, the devastation that this drought has caused is incredible. Not giving us much choice where to drive. <laughs> this male lion is walking in these thickets. Right, we're also getting to Gary Main, which means that he is about to cross out of an area that we can drive on. I'm just quickly going to call Mike. Um, Mike, Steph, I've relocated this um, male line. He's about to cross Gary Main at the junction with Weaver's Nest. It's just Mike was in the area to come and follow up here with us. Let's see. We can get one last visual of this male before he decides to leave us and go wherever he was going. He's definitely heard something and he's definitely en route to whatever that is. Probably his brothers. He's one of a coalition of four male lions that hold this area. There he is here. And you can just see from that bristly mane. Oh, he is beautiful. In the prime of his life, mature male lion, and he's just crossed out of our traverse into a neighboring property. Now, just because we can't go there doesn't mean these animals respect that they've just got 
the most amazing amount of land to wander in and to be as free as lions can be. Oh, look how tall he is when he stands up like that. Now, if you had to stand next to your wall, he'd probably, with his head up like that, fit under your chin. The average man, he'd fit under your chin, not quite being able to look into your eyes. But nevertheless, an imposing figure, 500 pounds or so of male lion, disappearing there into the bush. <laughs> All right, and of a disappearing male lion, Jamie's definitely got one that's not running anywhere. Enjoy that one. <laughs> This lion is definitely not running anywhere. How utterly adorable is that? Tiny, tiny little face suckling away from mom. There's number two at the back. <laughs> little ears popping out. We are so spoiled to have moments like this. Isn't it absolutely incredible? This, these cubs are minute. There's mum. Look, their ears are starting to come up. They're now looking far more robust and capable of moving around. Mum has done a wonderful job of looking after them. Now, the reason that we are comfortable here, and this is something that we do need to reiterate to everybody is with lionesses they're, when they are with their cubs at this age they are more than capable of looking after them and we don't at this age we don't view leopard cubs we don't look for leopard cubs however when we have a known den site and with lion cubs and we know that the mother is with them and in this case she's got the support of three other lionesses then we are comfortable in sitting and watching them from a distance and speaking obviously very very softly so that we don't disturb them. But we are right, if we have a look at where we are, we're right on the opposite side of the drainage line so we're far away. You can see we are zoomed in very very close in order to get that view so just to give you guys a little bit of comfort in terms of our distance from the lioness and our level of interference we're not affecting her in any way the rest of the pride are around her we don't have a view of them at the moment oh sorry my silly beanie making its way into the view so there we go we can spend some time watching those amazing little creatures as they have their breakfast utterly adorable look at that little face don't know where the older three are, but we have so many exciting moments to look forward to when these three cubs grow, or in the next few weeks when they are big enough and strong enough to keep up with the rest of the pride. They're going to start playing with their cousins. Oh, oh little ones. Where did breakfast bar, where did the milk bar go? <laughs> oh, shame, little ones. Did mommy dislodge you without any warning? <laughs> Joseph Payne, in terms of our little cubs and their age, oh, I'm sorry, I can't concentrate. I'm overwhelmed by just the sheer cuteness of this sighting. Oh, little ones. Oh, my goodness. Joseph, sorry, you wanted to know how old they are. Um, so we can't be 100% sure, but when we first found them, we suspected that they were about 10 days old. They're probably now approaching three weeks or so. Maybe just a little, yeah, about three weeks, I think, is a, a good estimate of their age. Oh, 
now starting to play with each other. Crawling over each other and now really starting to explore their world even going so far as to try and climb up that fallen stump. They've come out of the drainage system and are now attempting to find Mom. Now Dr. Rob and Soraya, again my apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. I don't, I wouldn't, I've always found it an odd practice of ours to assign human years to to animals' lives, so the you know the whole story of seven dog years being the equivalent to, or sorry, seven human years being the equivalent to a dog year, but a lion would be, if we had to compare it that way, a lion would be very similar to a medium-sized dog. So their life expectancy takes them up to about thirteen. The one thing that takes the lions a bit longer is their. <laughs> the age at which they reach sexual maturity. So puppies and kittens usually first start their heat or their estrus cycle at around six or so months. Lions will not be ready, or female lions will not be able to reproduce until they're around two years old. So that takes a little bit longer in the development of lions and leopards than, oh, little one, than it does for dogs. Are you lost? Are you lost, baby? Your mom's coming back. To investigate. <laughs> Where are you going, baby? Cubs have gone into this long, thick grass. I'm just trying to get them back. The other one is now on a mission somewhere. He's going on an adventure. Calling. <laughs> oh, wow. How amazing is this? Back you go, little one. A little bit too young for adventures. Isn't that incredible? Uh, I suspect by the age of this lioness, she's very young. I wouldn't be at all surprised if this is her first litter. Oh, I want to go, Mom. I want to go on an adventure. And isn't it incredible, those jaws that are have enormous crushing power, capable of killing a buffalo, and yet uh, are so phenomenally gentle with the little ones. All right, Mom, well, you've, you've picked me up and carried me back here. We'll at least have the decency to roll over and give me breakfast. you're all getting some amazing screenshots. This is too special for words. Oh, Mom. Come on. Open up the milk bar again. <laughs> Bath time. That's amazing, Phoebe. Very, very impressive indeed. Phoebe's managed to split her attention from these 
lion cubs and is wondering about the bird that is singing merrily away. <laughs> Next to us, yes, Phoebe, it is the white browed squirrel robin that is chirping away happily. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to try and look for it because I don't want to take my eyes off the cub for a second just to make sure that we see whatever's going on. But very well done, yes, that was the white browed, it is the white browed squirrel robin that is happily rejoicing in the morning sunlight. They have a range of, a very wide range of tunes that they whistle and sing away beautifully. Definitely one of the most pleasant birds to listen to. <laughs> I don't know where the other two have gone. Now James in Texas, obviously you are aware of the, the biggest threat to the cubs being a strange male lion. and You wanted to know why the, there are no males around to protect the cubs from strange males. And the answer is there are, in a way, but they can't do it by staying with one pride the whole time. Also bearing in mind that the Birmingham boys have got cubs further to the south of us as well, so in the direction that that male was going. So the likely fathers of these cubs have a very, very important job to do. They don't, they're not hands-on fathers, but they're patrolling the territory constantly and by constantly roaring, by urine spraying, all of that is a their way of protecting the, the with the pride the whole time, but they patrol and they've got an enormous territory that they've got to patrol in the in this particular this particular coalition. Oh look at the little claws. <laughs> Desperately trying to get underneath Mum to have a drink. so cute. Gone on mushy. Come on, Mama. Don't. I'm not interested in whether or not your feet are clean. I want to have breakfast. Look at the little paws in comparison to hers. Oh. How special is this? <laughs> tiny, tiny little feet in the air. I think the other two must have gone to sleep in the thick area behind her. special moments. <coughs> now while we watch our lioness clean her paw and her little cub as, as well, Michael, who is 18 years old, has raised a very salient question. And that is, why do we not name all of the lions in the way we do the leopards? Because we... Oh, shame, that little one's got a cut on it. Is that a cut or a leaf on its leg? Sorry, Michael, I will get back to you in one moment. Little one. I think that might just be a leaf that it's gathered. I can't really tell. Sorry, Michael. So you, you raise a good point, because we've named Amber Eyes. Why don't we name all of them? Um, there's nothing to stop us from doing it. And Traditionally, a pride, the individuals in a pride aren't named. The reason individual leopards are giving na given names is because they are solitary creatures and there's less of them than there are lions. Whereas, for the most part, 
sorry, her licks are so powerful that it's just moving the cub's entire head. <laughs> and it couldn't be less interested in bath time. <laughs> so cute. And those spines on her tongue are capable of rasping meat away from bone. She's using it very, very gently. Oh, sorry, Michael, I promise I'll answer you in a moment. Ah, oh, it is a little cut. Probably from a thorn or one of its siblings. Nothing serious at all. Oh, baby. There you go, there you go. Quickly, little one. Oh, no, I'm going on another adventure. Wobbly legged lack of coordination there. Is mom gonna pick it up again? Stop it disappearing. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I promise I'll answer your question in a moment. Oh, off mom goes. Checking on the rest of her pride mates. Now, if the pride does get up and move off, or if she moves away from, if they move away from this area, then we will leave, so that we are not here while the cubs are on their own. But for now, she's just lying down a little way off from the fidgeting figure of her little cub. Sorry, Michael. So the reason traditionally that individual lions are not given names is because, as I said, they're not solitary like leopards. And there are more of them. So we don't need to, or traditionally guides haven't needed to label each and every individual lion. They do, members of a coalition do tend to be named, but only really in cases where they are a particularly dominant coalition. So the Mopohos had names, each and every individual Mopoho in that coalition of six males. But the Salati males, for example, are not necessarily referred to by name. We refer to them as timber males by name, hairy belly and ginger, the ginger male. There's nothing to stop us from naming the individual lionesses, and yes, in a way we have, actually, just to make it easier for us to keep track of the individuals, particularly now that there are cubs involved. So there's the two-spot lioness and the grey-faced lioness and so on. But those are not official names. Traditionally, hyenas are not given names either. They are just referred to by their clan because there are so many of them. Bear in mind that a lion pride in this area could actually potentially even go up to 20, 30, 40 lions. It would be very difficult to keep track of them all. But the answer is basically it's just tradition. A little one. But Amber Eyes we've named because she's so distinctive. She's very easily, instantly recognisable. <laughs> You're going off to join your siblings. Hmm? Oh, no wonder you've got a cut on your leg, climbing in and out of those thorn trees. has disappeared from view for now and our lioness has become very very difficult to see so while we wait for them to come out more into the open let's go across to Steph for a quick update. What a treat to you with those that lioness with those lovely cubs isn't it amazing on a day like today where we've got lions literally falling out of the bush left right and center which is lucky completely atypical to how a normal safari with me goes. What we've decided to do is leave that male lion be. He's crossed over our boundary and he's heading south on some errand or another. It looks like his brother was calling him or he's getting himself into a fight. And we've moved into a pattern that 
hopefully will show me where Karula's tracks are or where she is at the moment. Last night we had her tracks going up Philemon's cut line heading towards the lodge. And the last track I had of, was of one of her cubs heading towards the Vuyatela Dam, but her tracks headed off in a more sort of northwesterly direction. And I'm convinced that I missed the tracks of the cub crossing over and, uh, and that she headed towards the drainage line that lies on the western side of quarantine. And that's what we're doing now. Is now we're just checking this road very, very carefully to see if we can find where her tracks cross over again or what she's been up to. And that's basically the plan. As with all things that I plan, it'll probably be exactly opposite to what I end up doing by the end of safari. But nevertheless, it is the way it is. It does allow me to talk to you a little bit about what I think happened to that male lion. I think that that was the male lion that has been mating with the female over the last couple of days. I think she's probably reached the end of her, um, of her cycle at the moment and that allows the couple to split up. He would have been hearing his brothers roaring at night time. He would have been listening to the news of the bush around male lions. When they're not mating, they're defending a territory, as I'm sure Jamie has been talking to you about. And just from the look of him, that, that very fast walk that he was doing, the roar, how we found him, was him roaring, that stopping, looking in one direction, carrying on walking, listening in one direction, and carrying on walking, that's typical of a male lion that's defending territory. quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world, but we will be back up and stick with us because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions by
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gari repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on. Welcome back, welcome back. Excuse us for these technical gremlins that creep in from time to time, bringing you a live show all the way from deep in the African bush isn't without its hazards and its trials and tribulations. But in any case, it's given us some time to have a look at some Senegal lapwing that are on this open area. Now, these birds are often seen or often heard and not that often seen. And it's because they're quite scarce. They become what's called locally common because they fly around together in these small little flocks of between five and seven birds, mostly at night. They're active mostly at night. During the day, they tend to lie up looking very similar to bits and pieces of dung. And at night time, you hear their calls, a very beautiful call that for years I couldn't actually place to a bird, to be quite honest until a tracker friend of mine said that this is the bird. They favor these very short grass areas and this is probably one of the most southerly portions of the range that they're occurring. Generally this bird is found in Zimbabwe and Mozambique which lie to the north of where we are, the north and the east of where we are. So quite lucky for us to see them. And they feed mainly on termites. So they termite eating birds. I heard a very interesting fact from James the other day that he had found somewhere that stated that the weights or the biomass of termites is equal to the biomass of everything else out here living, that is, uh, in the Kruger National Park. Isn't that amazing? And these birds are taking the most out of that particular opportunity by running around, probably able with those long legs to flick open to flick open bits and pieces of dung to lift up a piece of dung or to literally and and this makes more sense actually if they are nocturnal birds mainly they would be eating harvested termites which are active mainly at night cutting the grass short and taking it to their nests to begin their digestive process of the grass during the day these birds would then feast on harvested termites mainly that's what i'm saying is probably the reason for them being active at night time on these short grass areas. Absolutely. All right, but from our Senegal lapwings to a fluff ball with Jamie. <laughs> um, for now, our fluff balls have disappeared and I think they've gone to sleep in the thick grass. Watched over by their long-suffering, very patient mother. Hold on, that's not, oh, that's a cub. Is that a cub? Or is that her leg? I'm confused, what's going on there? It's her leg, it just looks so strange. Uh, I see, I see how she's lying now. Now I understand. <laughs> I was very confused for a second. <laughs> I've worked. I've I've got it now. But it. I, I mean, at first that really looked like a cut because it didn't look conceivably like it could be part of her body. But her right. That's her right front foot. 
that she's got stretched out to the side like that. Okay, so our little cubs have gone to bed. I think it's time for us to actually leave them. What we can do is try and get around to the other lionesses. And Javu, who is a new viewer, it is wonderful to hear from you. And I apologize once again on behalf of our team for the technical difficulties. But as you can imagine, live streaming from the middle of the African bush is very complicated. But Javu says that he's really enjoying this particular channel because they've never seen anything like it before. And that's because there definitely isn't anything like it anywhere in the world. It's lovely to hear from you. We would also love to hear where you are from. We just adore hearing about new viewers. And don't forget, we are on twice a day, every single day. First thing in the morning for three hours and then in the afternoon for our time. And I'm sure there will be people who can help you out in terms of time, depending upon where you are watching from. But we are on twice a day. Every day we have a marvelous a collection of animal characters that we monitor or try to find you at least once a week, depending on which particular character you're talking about. But we've got leopards and lions, and at the moment, the prospects for the next few weeks are absolutely incredible. We've got leopard cubs wandering about. We've got new, new lion cubs, clearly. We've got an older set of lion cubs bouncing about. And then, of course, all of the other marvels of the African bush, because it's not just about the big cats, although we do love them, but there's elephants and buffalo and all kinds of fantastic things. And we're very fortunate to be jumping on board when Steph is driving, which is a rare treat. You can pick his brains for all of the incredible information he's got stored there. What was that? Something, something moved. It sounded a bit bigger than a lioness, but perhaps just a lioness shuffling in the dry leaves. Could have been an elephant. Oh, I've actually only just seen the other lionesses from where we're sitting. Um, if you go a little bit to the left there, are you going to be able to see them? Huh? Yes. Here we go. The, the lionesses are there. <laughs> you can just, just make out movement. And there's a nose and a face. Oh, flop. I think it was her that made that noise. I think she just moved that branch and it rustled a lot of the dead leaves. So for now, I think we're going to leave our sleeping lionesses. Oh! Look at this, look at this, look at this cat. Up in the dead tree. That was the hawk eagle that was trying to catch the Franklins. There they are, there's the male. And the female is also here. Our fantastic bird hunters, how exciting is that? Live safaris, you never know what's going to come tumbling out of the sky. And that Franklin made an incredibly fortunate escape from two birds that are specialized Franklin and guinea fowl hunters. Awesome! African hawk eagle, one of my favorite birds of prey. And they nearly, nearly got that Franklin. And then she, the poor Franklin, seeking refuge, nearly landed in the mouth of a hungry lioness. Not having a good day. But I think that it escaped them. That was so cool. Really, really exciting. <laughs> In that thick vegetation, that Franklin's heart must be beating frantically. Go ahead, Mike. Absolutely, Mike. Uh, make your way towards the fire break. Uh, the best, best access is from there. Uh, we'll pull out. Uh, tax made it a two-vehicle lock. Um, I'm, it's just myself currently, so we can actually stay here together, but you'll have a better view if I move. Sorry, guys. But at least you've got a Beautiful bird of prey to look at. Oh, Mike, um, if you take Bovelzook East and you come along there and then go west along the fire break, you'll see the two track easily. Ah, oh, that was phenomenally exciting. 
There's one African hawk eagle. I don't think Khat can show you the second. I don't know if you can see it there. It's on the top of the dead tree a little bit further away. Are these particular birds of prey? Mm, yes, perfect. Well done. Awesome. Now these particular birds of prey are specialized bird hunters. And they generally circle, one flying high and one flying low, and attack from several angles. And then they'll share their kill, because as with all raptors, they are monogamous and they mate for life. So whenever they work together to catch something like a franklin or a guinea fowl, they will then share that particular kill. That was awesome! just goes to show, and this often happens to us, whenever you're sitting still, the bush actually provides you with the most incredible sightings. And they've missed out on breakfast for now. They're taking some time to smooth out ruffled flight feathers. And grooming is absolutely essential for these birds to maintain their streamlined shape and their agility. The name hawk applies. They are true eagles. But as the name hawk applies, they've got an incredible ability to whirl and weave and turn and duck and dive. Very, very agile in the air. Aren't they beautiful? I think African hawk eagles are one of the most beautiful birds of prey. It's that mottled white and brown color. Dark, dark brown. They're absolutely stunning. And it's not often that we get to view them from this sort of proximity. I mean, this male, and I, see, I think it's the male because he's smaller, this male is sitting right above us. It's absolutely marvellous. We really don't often get this opportunity to look at them so closely. Look at that. Oh, wow. Is that incredibly bright blue sky. Off they go. And that marks the end, I think, of our hawk eagle sighting for now. But absolutely incredible. And Justin S., <laughs> we've been completely distracted. There's so many things to look at. Are there any birds that, are, um, that have become extinct in South Africa or are in danger of becoming extinct? Not that I don't know of any birds, um, species that have gone extinct. There are several that are in serious danger of becoming extinct. All of our raptor species, as with pretty much anywhere in the world, are starting to face serious threats due to habitat loss, power lines, and in the case of vultures, serious poaching problems. So vultures are valuable for their, or valued, and they're not actually, obviously, but they're valued for their traditional medicine use. It's absolute nonsense. It's thought that you can, if you make a potion out of a vulture brain, that you will be able to see into the future. And what people do is they poison carcasses and leave them out for the vultures, and they can kill 200 vultures at a time. That's very very distressing practice that occurs here in South Africa, and it has put a lot of our vulture species on the red list in terms of really endangered, critically endangered species. The ground hornbills are also incredibly endangered. So there's about 1,500 left in the whole world. So whenever we see them, whenever we see these massive birds the size of turkeys, the biggest of the hornbill family, whenever we see them, just remember that there are only so many individuals left in the whole wide world. Um, some of the smaller birds are doing absolutely fine. Most of the smaller birds are doing fine. The difficulty is we've got not only the habitat loss, um, you've got artificial forests like the ones in Johannesburg being created, which in turn completely messes with the local birds that would have been there originally because they're being outcompeted by things like grey go away birds and um, parrots and so on. Where's Mike gone? Sorry. I think he's gone and got a little bit lost. Just wait for him. All right, well, I'm going to have to chat to him on the Game Drive channel, so we'll speed up this answer. Yes, so that messes with the natural balance of things. So it's not just habitat loss, it's a change of habitat, it's climate change, and it's poaching and destruction of the birds. But there's a lot of very, very wonderful organizations out there dedicated to protecting our bird species. Our cubs have gone to sleep, our lioness has gone to sleep, so we're going to let Mike come and take our place. While we chat, let's send you back across to Steph for an update.
<laughs> and everyone's going to sleep, Jeremy. Like we we quite wide awake over here, trying to have a look for for where Karula went last night. Her tracks, unfortunately, do not come out on this road, and um, and that's a pity because <clears throat> I didn't see any tracks today at the dam wall, and we definitely didn't see any tracks around the camp when we left early this morning. So either she's somewhere into this thick area of bush over to the side, or we've missed something along the way, we've missed a clue, we've missed her walking across somewhere with these cubs. Nevertheless, she will come out absolutely again at some point and then we'll find her and hopefully show it to you. Now, apart from flies, this is one of the times of the year that we have quite a big insect lull. We don't have a lot of insects around at the moment. There will be, I mean, you can stick your face into a bush over here and you'll pull out something uh, that's creepy crawly and quite scary. But for the most part, the insects now are taking their time to go through their various changes, to go through the various metabolisms, to hide up. And then as soon as summer starts, as soon as the temperature starts to increase and is at a certain mean average day and night, these insects will come out in their profusion. And you have, ooh, it's flying, driving me mad. You have um, definitely a, not as many multitudes as insects over a short space of time as you have in some of the more temperate areas. There's a squirrel that just went into this tree hole right on the main branch here. I'm just seeing if it'll come out. And let's see. They're quite reactive to uh, to vehicle movement and to noise. These tree squirrels. I don't. Let's see if it sticks their head out. This time of the morning, tree squirrels would be sunning themselves. I have no doubt that we scared this little squirrel into its hole. Coming up to this, coming up to this tree. I just got the tail end and a scrabble. No, not going to come out today. Well, it'll come out today, but only after we leave here, most likely. Let's carry on. Got a pesky fly, just one that's busy buzzing around, aiming for my nostril every time it comes around the front of my head. Let's just check this junction. This was the, basically the last area that I saw Karula's cubs come out and Karula's tracks. They were heading in this direction here. But they don't come out here. In any case, let's carry on going. The purple roller here, on top of the tree, That we can't get too close, that's about as close as we're gonna get. It does look like there's some tail streamers though. But I think just from the general size of this particular oh, there we go, it's a purple roller. You might notice in your screens the very white eyebrow patch. Large size. Relatively large size. I know it doesn't look too big on your screens right now, but relatively big uh, for a roller, and then the lack of tail streamers, those thin feathers on the sides of the the tail. That makes that a purple roller, the largest roller that we have in this particular area. Deep mauve chest. Now just back onto those insects that we were talking about. Um, we can start expecting to see a definite increase in insect activity from around about the middle of September with the height of the insect activity basically around about the deep summer month, so January, February, March is when we have the most insect activity around and then it's almost like a frenzy. These insects are just going crazy. It doesn't matter what these insects are busy with from wood eating to hunting, they're just all over the place. All right, now I'm swinging onto quarantine to see if perhaps those tracks of Karula come out here somewhere. I must be honest, 
I'd love to be able to see those little cubs. I haven't seen her cubs yet in person. I also haven't seen those lion cubs that you've been watching with Jamie today in person. I haven't seen any of the Nkuhuma Prides cubs at all. All the Sticks Prides cubs. With me having walking around on foot most of the time out here, seeing baby lion cubs and seeing baby leopard cubs is not something that you aim at doing during a bushwalk segment. Just on that, Herbert is on leave at the moment, and so we won't be doing too many bushwalks over the next couple of leaves. He's also having to take some time off to go and visit with his family and his children. He'll be back towards the end of the week, I think, over the weekend sometime, and we'll get those bushwalks out again. So no tracks here where we are. <laughs> Jamie's very kindly offered for me to go back to the lion cubs as she's left the, the sighting. That's very kind of her. Right now, I have my eye set on trying to figure out where these leopard tracks go from last night. That's a bit of a better view of that purple roller. Let's go back a little bit. I oh, know, where are you going? Flying there, not rolling at the moment. Just flying from tree to tree here across quarantine. They're quite territorial birds and you find that they're, what they're doing is from flying from one tree to another, it's not only displaying how beautiful and vibrant his colors are, but also how fit he is. And he's patrolling the edges of his territory to make sure that there's no imposter. The same purple roller that we were having a look at just a little bit earlier. Just still busy scanning over here. These open areas are notoriously difficult in actual fact to track things on because animals are not confined to a game path. Leopard generally like to use game paths going from one place to another. But in this particular instance, they can literally walk across any part of the open area. And very often you miss where tracks have come out or gone onto an area because of that. And you have to get out and follow them one track for one track, which is time consuming, of course. Instead of just being able to sort of intuitively know where to go and look for these things or where it's most likely that you'll find one. Looking over the shoulder there, it seemed like a vulture, but there are no vultures in there. We're almost exactly back where we first heard those impala calling this morning, which led us to that male lion that we found for you a few minutes ago. If I were to guess where Karula's tracks came out, this would be round about where they were heading. Now, leopard, the male lion, when they're walking on a particular mission, also just walk in a straight line in the direction that they're going. And that was how we found or refound that male lion after losing him through that very thick bush, was you just hopscotched in front of him. Leopard are a little bit more routine like in that fashion, in that they also like to walk in straight lines. Now, I haven't been around, even though I've been doing this for so long, I haven't been around that many leopard that I'd be able to tell you what they do with cubs, and especially cubs that old. I don't know exactly, do leopard walk in straight lines with their cubs? Do they like to walk zigzags with their cubs? I'm not too sure. That is something that I don't really know, but she hasn't come out here heading straight from where her tracks last were to the water. They're also not water dependent both leopard and lion can actually go without water getting enough moisture from the food that they eat and she of course would still be supplementing the feed from uh, 
Mike, why are we driving around over here? Mike, all the way from Dallas. Good evening, Mike. It's deep in the night time there for you. Um, you've asked me an interesting question. Why do leopards not stick together like lions do? Mike, it's got simply to do with the prey that lion and leopard eat. The cats as a whole, except for lions, are all solitary hunters. And they, they are able to catch prey up to and a little bit over their own body weights, with the exception every now and again being, for instance, a leopard killing a full-grown kudu, or I've even heard of leopard taking on giraffe, with the exception of that. But as the sort of predator-prey arms race at the larger end of the scale starts to increase and prey starts putting on more weight and getting faster, it's not feasible for a predator to gain more weight. Currently, the tigers are the heaviest cats on the planet. You're looking at a big tiger weighing anywhere up to 350 kilograms and a big male lion weighing up to 250 kilograms. And then you've got prey that they hunt anywhere from 50 kilograms all the way up to 500 kilograms. You're looking at a buffalo, 800 kilograms or 1,600 pounds. There are even some elephant, or there are even some lion prides that hunt elephant. And this is where it gets interesting. Rather than a male lion turning into a 500 kilogram cat that wouldn't be able to move around or hunt effectively or basically be able to do any of those things, a, a 500 kilogram cat that needs to catch a 500 kilogram buffalo, for instance, splits into two cats. And as prey gets bigger and as pride sizes need to increase because of whatever prey is prevalent in that particular area, so you find the numbers of lions increasing as well. So where there's prey of a certain minimum weight that, for instance, a lot of kudu or a lot of zebra, you don't find large lion prides. But where you find a lot of buffalo and heavy, heavy boned antelope, buffalo, and I'm talking about things like elephant, lion prides can reach massive numbers up to 40 individuals, some lion prides in the Chobe, I've even heard up to 50 and over individuals. And that's because it just simply is the most efficient way to hunt large prey. And that is why lions have basically become these cooperative hunters. Although there's a lot of speculation as to how cooperative lions actually are. Do they hunt together as a cohesive unit that set ambushes and each one plans sort of as part of a whole? Or is it just each individual cat making for the best path that they can? You know, and each one basically just taking up whatever position that they feel best or un uncompeted. Ah. All right. So, we have our first clue as to where the ruler is. And I'm going to try and fit the dots together over here while I tell you. Here's a track here, relatively fresh. This is a female leopard track. And I must say, fresh enough for us to warrant following. Now, these tracks are not with cubs. Let me just double check over here and see. No, just a female and on top of buffalo and on top of zebra. So what I'm deciding has happened. Yesterday afternoon, Karula came in this direction with her two cubs and went for a drink. But stashing her cubs somewhere in here. These tracks of, are of her going back to where she left her cubs. And I'm convinced now that her cubs are somewhere in this particular block, behind where you are facing me now, somewhere in here. And there's a good chance that she was fetching her cubs to a kill. Leopards quite often do that, is they'll go and fetch their cubs to a kill, leave their cubs in that vicinity, go and drink at water, and go back again and that is what I think has happened now so this is a very very good opportunity excuse me just swatting at the flies that I have buzzing around my head that drive me insane but she's walked from that side here we go here you can see her tracks yeah and if I put my head down 
and I follow where these tracks are going. Here they walk across here. Here she's walking here. I've got some more tracks here. I've got some more tracks here. And they head underneath this bush in this direction. And that's exactly where we are going to see if we can go. So what I think we do is let's go down back to Philemon's dip and see if she doesn't come out on that side just to make sure that our hyenas haven't stolen that kill from her. But these are definitely fresh enough to follow. All right. Ooh, this fly. There's nothing on a fly. I think if I had to pay a fly one compliment is they are tenacious. All right, we're gonna go up here now. And we're going to go down Philemon's dip relatively slowly so that I can make sure that her tracks don't cross over again onto that side. And to do that, we're going to send you over to Jamie, who's coming into this area to try and give us a hand and see if we can find her. So while Steph makes his way towards Philemon's dip that Dave recently renamed while he was on one of my drives as Icicle Dip, because it's the coldest place on Juma. We're going to go and check out the southern boundary just to help Steph out. If we do happen upon Karula, I feel though it is entirely only fair if we hand that sighting over to Steph if we do find her. We're just going to make sure we're basically there as backup to help him out, make sure she hasn't crossed and so on. It's two eyes better than, or actually it's four sets of eyes better than two. I'm still absolutely riding the high of that incredible cub sighting with mom picking up the cub, carrying it around, oh, just so magical. And then to add to the mix a narrowly or a narrow escape on behalf of that Franklin, that whole sighting has just washed away the cobwebs of a relatively sleepless night. And I'm feeling thoroughly wide awake now. Oh, off we go in search of leopards. We've had lion cubs. Let's go find some leopard cubs. There's so many exciting things happening at the moment out in the African winter's bush. Okay. Now... Whenever we see leopards, one of the things that we try and do is if they deposit some scat upon the road in front of us or wherever they happen to be in the sighting, the one thing we do is we try and collect it, put it in a vial and send that through to Pan an organization called Panthera. And we do that so that they can do DNA tests and examine the paternity of the different leopards. So really, really exciting project, awesome to see. I'm so, so cross with myself that I didn't realize that Shadow's cub had actually defecated in front of us. Because I went back and the scat was already gone, which is such a pity. But that's okay, we'll have plenty of opportunities to collect it. However, Shamson has asked a question that I'm not totally qualified to answer, but I can to an extent. And that is, if I can tell you a bit more about the organization Panthera and a bit more about the work that they do. So essentially, from what I understand, and I haven't, I've worked with different Panthera projects, I've, I, I haven't got an idea of the project as a whole, but from what I understand, they're a big cat research, obviously the name Panthera, big cat research company that is American-based, and what they do is they research big cats all across the world. Now here in South Africa, they play a very, very important role in monitoring of leopards, I spoke yesterday about the leopard population and the fact that we have no idea what the total population is in an area like the Lofelt. We know there's, I mean, the Sabi sand we're pretty much on top of. We know the individual leopards, they've been very well habituated. But there are places where we have no idea. So what Panthera does is they provide sponsorship and support to individual researchers who are in the process of doing their PhDs or whatever it happens to be, big studies on cats. They provide them with things like camera traps motion sensored cameras as well as incredible software that is like facial recognition but for spot patterns and essentially flips through all of the photos and I'm talking I sifted through Emma and I sifted through 32,000 photographs 
the, when we worked with Panthera for three months one year. And I know that there's something that Emma's still doing where I used to work, sifting through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands, identifying, okay, there's a wildebeest, put in the wildebeest pile, hyena, hyena pile, so on and so forth. So that was just in one area. 100 camera traps, one on each hyena, one on each side of a spot so that you get both sides of the leopard. And we got some amazing photos out of it. We got honey badgers walking past, a hyena with another hyena's head in its mouth incredible stuff as well as of course the leopards and what they do with that is they then calculate the overall population and they go to things like hunting organizations and say stop issuing permits for hunting leopards because we don't we don't have as many leopards as we think we do and that sort of thing so they're really really valuable research then of course there's the DNA project that they're doing which is going to give us a much better understanding of the way that leopard paternity works. I'm particularly excited about that. I think it's going to be fascinating. We can't expect results anytime soon. Projects like this take years to finalize and to publish and to make available to the public, but it will happen. And the Panthera essentially provides that level of support in big cat studies. Now, I'm sure that there is lots more that they do. Um, now, I'm unfamiliar I'm not familiar with all of their projects but I know that they do provide a do a huge amount of good in terms of increasing our knowledge and understanding of the big cats around the world but particularly here in South Africa and that's just a little bit of a, a background on the organization Panthera we also log every sighting that we have with wild dogs ground hornbills um, cheetah, any of the big cats, that all goes into their system as well because not only do they help with big cats but they make their technology available in terms of the monitoring of other species as well. An incredibly positive organization and really practical good rather than just throwing money at a potential problem. What's happening here? What have we seen? Are we looking at a roller? In the... Presumably not. That would be into the sun for the guests. Have they found leopard tracks, I wonder? Let's slowly inch forward. I don't want to affect their sighting in any way. Sorry guys, hold on one second. Uh, sorry stations, didn't mean to bump a sighting. What's here? Okay, copy. Can I come past and then I'll join the lineup? Copy, thanks. Bump to sighting! Surprise, surprise! Copy that. I'm just going to come past and then I will pull out straight away. Cool, guys. So we've got a standby two position for the sighting, but they have very kindly said that we can come through and just have a quick look at what it is they are looking at. Where are we looking, guys? Where am I looking? Am I being silly? She's on the termite mound there. It's going to be a very difficult view. She is south of our boundary, unfortunately. Chad, can you see her there on the edge of the termite mound? Uh, there we go. That looks like Karula to me. Oh, it's difficult to tell. 
And we're just giving you a quick view. We can't stay because we've actually bumped the sighting. So what that means is we've come through by accident. They've just found her and there are other vehicles that are making their way in. So what we've done is we've joined a lineup in order to see her. So we can't stay, we will have to go. But just a quick glimpse of the lovely Karula. Sorry, Steph. I think it's her. I can't be 100% sure. Actually, hold on. Is this a female? Hmm, I can't tell. I definitely can't tell who we've got here. Sorry, I jumped to conclusions a bit quickly, but I actually can't see. I think it's her. Looks like, a, you know, it sounds ridiculous. Looks like the back of her head. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully she doesn't decide to go further south. We are on the south of our boundary. Okay, awesome. Very, very cool. She looks, she's looking south, which is unfortunate. I'm just trying to gauge size from where I am. I think it is Karula. I do think it is Karula. I'll find out from the other guides. I have to pull out of the sighting now, because as I said, we've, we've bumped it. So we'll move out again, and we will take our place in the queue. But I think, unfortunately, this might be the last view that we have of her, because I think she's going to go south. She's going to go away from us. And that's very nice to know exactly where she is. She's probably left her cubs somewhere on Juma. Uh, there's still that possibility, but she's clearly hunting. Resting in the shade of the termite mound, but her body language says to me she's looking for something. Hopefully she decides to catch something on our side. Not that we... <laughs> she can catch things wherever she wants to. She, obviously the animals don't recognize our boundaries. But I think that will be... I think let's have one last look, because I don't think we're going to see her again. I'll try and move... Uh, I can't move, I'm afraid. I, don't, I think if we go forward, we're going to put the branches in the way. Standing by. Okay, copy that. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, we've got a place, guys. We don't have to go away. Let me try and move out of the way here. Sorry, everybody. Thanks so much. Very much appreciated. <laughs> I think she's going to disappear that way. Thanks very much. Oh, it's Sinead, guys. Driving past us. She's obviously with a new guide for Nkoro. There we go. Oh, Steph, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to steal her, your sighting. <laughs> Definitely not what I intended to do. There. But it does give us an opportunity to watch her before she disappears. I hope she doesn't disappear before the next vehicle gets here because they won't be able to find her again knowing Karula. Right. Let's just confirm. Is it her? Oof. Bit difficult to see, isn't it? In this area, it is most likely. Hello, girl. What do we think of... Oh, yes. No, that's her. That's definitely her, right? I'm not going crazy. Watching the approach of another vehicle. So this is a tricky position for us to be in, so we're going to have to do some repositioning here. Let me just chat to who have we got approaching here. Yeah, let me just move out of the way here. And they can come and get a different view. Oh, she's looking to the south. I think she is going to go in there. How's it? Sorry. Good, thanks. How are you? Looks like she's going to head south. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I'm blocking your way. No, it's alright. I'm going to try to stay with her because Ted wants to see her as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, no, no, no problem. Let me go, let me reposition slightly. Oh, 
the joys of a sighting on a main road. Okay, hold on everybody. We're just going to try and reposition to make sure everybody can get a view. It's a very tricky spot. Shame, and the guide very kindly says he doesn't want to push her further south where we can't see her. Oh goodness. No, we're causing a serious traffic jam here. Right, we're pulling out everybody. There's lots of vehicles here. Um, there's a little bit of, I'm, I'm not talking game drive vehicles, I'm talking chaos in terms of moving out for other vehicles. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pull out of this situation and leave the guys to it. It's definitely getting more complex than than anticipated. So while we sort this out, let's go across to Steph for an update. <laughs> don't you just love sightings on boundaries between properties that don't share the same traverse? It is this delicious chaos that develops and everyone takes it so seriously instead of just getting down and enjoying the sighting. But anyway, that's the way it is out here and that's part of why we find so many good sightings is because we've got this really interconnected network of really, really skilled field guides and the associated trackers and they're all, we're all helping one another to unravel. All, right. all unraveling the mystery that is the movements of animals out here and as you saw from that male lion a little bit earlier today and now from Karula, things are crossing boundaries all the time, coming across, moving in, moving out. And just, and it's what makes it so exciting is that we get these new characters, so to say, from time to time that spice up our lives. How boring would it be if we just had the click, at the click of a finger or at the click of a switch, we could show you whatever was out there. We'd be bleeding through a lot more presenters, I presume. Oh, it's been a lovely morning today, I must be honest with you. Started off a little bit crisp. It feels like there's this dampness or this heaviness in the air from something. I don't quite know if there's a cold front or two on the way. It's very common around this time of the year to have these cold fronts move up from the Western Cape, slide off of the Drakensberg and create a little bit of turmoil here. Ah. Here we have a group of dwarf mongoose sunning themselves on this termitarium. Excuse me while I just answer the radio for Jamie. Uh, go Jamie. Copy that, thank you. Alright, so Jamie's just given us an update that it's just Karula and not her cubs. So there's a good chance that the cubs are still stashed somewhere here. And that's good news. It means that she will at some point recross the boundary again, unless she's taken her cubs across the boundary and have hidden them somewhere in the vicinity of where she is now, which is quite possible. There's been a lot of lion activity around Juma and Vuya Telepan and with Sindile and Amvula around as well, it's not the safest place for a leopard to keep her cubs. So it's not un it wouldn't be unfeasible for me to believe that she's taken her cubs across somewhere else. But what you're looking at now are definitely not leopard cubs. They are dwarf mongoose and some of the most characterful of the animals that, that we found out here. What they're doing now is they've spent the night in that termite mound, nice and safe and secluded in their little burrows. And they are sunning themselves, which is a common activity for dwarf mongoose to do on a morning like this. And you can see from young to old, all related, it's one family. An alpha pair are the ones that have the babies. And as the babies reach maturity, when they move through adolescence, they will then move off and look for their own females that are doing the same thing to start their own families. You can see that that termite mound is just basically a hive of, of activity of the moment. Easily I can count 10 to 12 of them. They'll start getting moving now. 
cover a few hectares, a couple of hundred yards in either direction they'll be foraging for and they're busy looking for insects. They will eat anything from beetles to scorpions, spiders to termites, centipedes. I don't think they eat millipedes unless it's the only, oh, unless it's the only uh, insect that's available. But definitely everything else. Even small snakes. But right now they're just enjoying each other's company and enjoying the warmth of the sun. <laughs> Stretched out. Now they, because they're so gregarious, because they're so, I would almost say to a point they're even quite aggressive, they don't seem to bo get bothered by cars at all. And we're finding that little mongoose clans, like this particular one, that actually live in close proximity to our camps, get very relaxed. I know on occasion when I walk through the camp, there's a mongoose clan that likes to raid the dustbins around camp. And I've been within a couple of feet of them without them giving me the slightest bit of attention. One of, definitely one of my favorites. Absolutely. Now, Michael, you've asked me a question. How long does it take to habituate an animal? Uh, Michael, that's actually a very, very good question because it doesn't, it's not a very easy answer. It's a game of give and take, really. It's a game mainly of respect, where you try and establish boundaries. And because you're not working with food as a reward like you would when you're dealing with dogs or cats, you're not working with a clicker, um, you're literally just doing it based on animal behavior with you being biased towards the animal. You obviously, on, these are not trained animals, they're not in any, in any way... Um, you know, we don't alter their behavior. This is completely wild. And because we try and be biased towards these particular animals, it can sometimes take quite a long time. And because the borders are open, they're porous here, you get animals that have never seen vehicles, have never seen cars coming in quite often and upsetting that balance, in particular with elephant and lion and leopard. Um, we see that those animals that come in from a place that doesn't have vehicles very often you find they come with some habits. Charging the vehicles um, is probably the most common of the bad behaviors that we see. And quite often the only way that you, you can get rid of that is by staying in close proximity to that animal. And I remember quite fondly um, a time when I was a bit younger, we had a male lion come in from the Kruger National Park. And he took about a year to stop charging the cars. I mean, he was seeing over a three hour game drive, probably up to about 10 vehicles. Um, and then we'd leave him alone for the day. And then that afternoon he'd be seen again or we'd find him again and he'd see another five or 10 vehicles. And without doubt, at least once during the day, he'd get up and he'd chase a car full of guests or chase a ranger. And I tell you, the apprehension and anxiety that I used to feel going into these sightings with that particular cat was something incredible. You knew you were going to get charged, you just didn't know when or to who it was going to happen next. Definitely adds a spice. Leopard, being far more intelligent than lion, can sometimes not get rid of a bad behavior trait. You just sometimes find that these cats develop a bad attitude because of an experience that they've had somewhere along the line. And quite often, these particular animals, we won't allow any vehicles close to. I remember a sighting once of a male we used to call the double M male. He had an M spot pattern on his head. And eventually, we just stopped seeing this particular male leopard for about six months. We just made it a, a sighting, a negative sighting, we call it here. And that was just to give this cat the time he needed to get over his particular uh, affinity for wanting to charge cars. We actually thought that he was going to jump into a car. He used to charge right up to the bull bar, almost knocking the trackers flat 
and then disappear and come rushing out of the bushes again. A very, very bad habit. And in that case, where you can't get respect from that animal, where you can't generate that, that boundary, um, we leave them alone. This is how we do it out here. Luckily, I haven't had anything to do with any of those types of animals since I've been at Juma, which is lucky. One of Karula's sons, actually, Kunyuma, was well known for charging cars on occasion, and I have seen Karula when she was pregnant hiss at cars, giving them a bit of a warning that they are overstepping their, their welcome, really. That being said, we share the lives of these animals very intimately. Out of a 24-hour day, they're hearing cars driving around here for six or seven hours a day. It's not a lot, but it tends to be in the prime moving times of when these animals are moving about. And quite often, they have vehicles attending them. And if you watch the show long enough, you'll absolutely learn about how we do that, how we pick which animal to do what to in terms of following always with the full respect going to the animal not the other way around we don't let them alter their behavior for us they dictate exactly how we behave they look like they're upset that day we leave them alone give them a bit more space now you might ask me what am I swiveling my head around for so much now that we know that Karula is with Jamie on Gary Main, and that following those particular tracts, we're probably going to lead us nowhere, we did find some male leopard tracks, which I feel can probably only be Mvula's tracks crossing Philemon's dip in this particular line. And since we've already gone onto Zoe's to go and have a look, I don't think that he's come out here yet. I think that he's still somewhere around here. The tracks were fresh from last night, but he would have moved away from that kill, gone for a drink at the pan at some point, and then carried on moving. And it looks like from the direction of those tracks that he is moving south and west all the way back to Arethusa. Have a look at this water buck here. Beautiful, one of the larger antelope species that we have out here. Quite common. A grass-eating antelope. The common waterbuck with that very bold circle on the rump. And you only find this waterbuck south of the Zambezi River. After that, you get the Defasa waterbuck, which becomes a little bit more common. And that doesn't have the very bold ring on its on its behind, it has a more washed out circle, more like a blaze rather than a circle like that. And that of course is a following mechanism. Each water buck has it and the babies, when in danger, put that round circle in their vision and just follow that and follow mom or follow the rest of the herd away from danger. Called a following mechanism. Excuse us for just keeping quiet. Absolutely right. Jandre just heard alarm calls of some impala off on our right hand side. Exactly where we had those fresh tracks of Mvula. Let's go back there. He's going to take us to turn around and go back again. That's obviously what we term this bush newspaper. The bush is busy telling us something. There's a predator about. And Paul has seen it. Now let's see. Let me turn around here. It is on the other side of the drainage line that comes from quarantine. And I'm just in my mind now trying to picture where was the last time I saw an impala and what does the terrain look like there? Where are we most likely to find this particular animal that's disturbing these impala now Brent is well known for charging off and he has a very good hit rate for finding animals like that myself 
I don't know, I put it down to me not wanting to drive these cars into the ground, I think. And I leave those types of pursuits to Brent, who's very, very good at it. Let's go up here. Now Impala will not call for too long. They normally only call for a minute or two. And whatever was disturbing them would then move off. But it does give you a window and an opportunity to see exactly where this animal may have moved. And the hope is that these Impala would still be blowing or making that alarm snort at whatever this animal is by the time we get there. So now we're going to cross the drainage line. That was a barrier to us on that side. And using my knowledge of the terrain, we're going to see if we can place ourselves exactly where we think that alarm call was coming from. Now there is an impala herd that lives on quarantine. And it seems like it'd be one of those. This area here, just in front of us, would be where I think this impala was calling from. So we're just gonna drive a little bit more forward, and then we're gonna stop and we're gonna switch off the car and we're gonna listen. Just want to get onto the crest so it gives us the full benefit of the crest. There's a bit of a tightrope here because we may switch off the vehicle and hear nothing. Let's switch off here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to listen carefully and see if there's a hope that we pick up the alarm calls of these animals. Such a difficult game, a guessing game, deciding where these alarm calls come from. I think that we're almost directly opposite where that alarm call was coming from. My gut feels telling me that it was inside these trees here where you're looking right now. That is my gut feel of, uh, of where I think these alarm calls were coming from. That water buck that we were looking at was right into that bush on the other side of the drainage line. Alarm calls have stopped. There's no doubt about that. So I think what we're going to do I think what we're going to do is we're going to go around the corner here and see if we don't pick up some of these impala, they would have moved off, run away, hopefully from this disturbance. And while it gives some, or it gives me some time to stick my tongue out my side of my mouth and listen and concentrate intently, I'm going to send you over to Jamie, who's got an update for you on that Karula sighting. It is really, really exciting. Fingers crossed, Steph manages to find whatever's upset that those impala so much. All right, I'm stopping to, to look at a more unusual track. I'm going to show you it in a moment. Then my update is that I have found, I think, where Karula's cubs are, where she's left them on Juma. They look as though, it looks as though from their tracks they are around the old quarry area. Oh. I'm not going to go tromping in there because they are all on their own. The times that we've actually approached Karula's cubs when mom hasn't been with them, they've been right on the edge of a road, so we haven't needed to go off-road to see them. So I'm just going to leave them be for now, and hopefully Karula decides to come back onto our side. Now, on Twin Dams Road, we have an interesting track to show you. I'm going to jump out to show you what I mean. And Chad, let me know if they want a quick link over to Stiff and his whatever exciting is happening there so never fear even though I don't have my earpiece in I will be able to send you back across what we're looking at is this line in the sand here now this is made very clearly 
by a creature that you often see if you're watching the dam cam. Now, I know that the dam cam is not working at the moment, but it's something that we regularly see. Um, and it's amazing because we often track this particular, in well, I don't know if it's the same individual. We often track him all the way from the Twin Dams Road right up to the Voyatella Dam, which is a distance of probably about two kilometers and just over a mile. And it is a track made by an animal called a monitor lizard, a very, very big lizard. His footprints are here on the edge of his track. It's very difficult to see. Sort of fingers extending out, reptilian fingers. And he walks in a very, very uniform swing to his tail. So it's kind of almost like a regular, like a snake track, except for the fact that there are tracks on either side of it. Now, if this were a snake track, if a snake about this wide would have a track that would do this. So it would, it would have, the curves would be much, the, the sort of the twist would be much tighter. So that's one of the big ways that you can tell the difference between just seeing a track like that straight away, you immediately know it's not a snake. It's also, this is very deeply grooved. It's very difficult for you guys to see, but this track is very deeply grooved, and that's made by the Legavan's tail. We call them a Legavan in South Africa. They are rock monitor lizards. Now that's what we're looking at there. And it's just interesting. It's the sort of thing that we, we register on a daily basis. It's just how far they can walk. One of those things that fascinates us as guides. I've parked at such an angle, I have to heft myself back into the car. <laughs> Sometimes it's tricky being short. Let's just grab a book quickly. I'll make sure my earpiece is in in case something marvellous happens. Oh, hold on. And somebody's trying to call me. Good timing. Standing by. Oh. Um, I'm looking for a picture for you to show you, but I'm taking forever to find them. You know what? Sometimes the index is a useful thing to use. There we go. 210. So this is the animal that we are looking at the tracks of. A very, very big lizard species. A rock monitor or a water monitor. I don't know which one it would be. Impossible to tell by their tracks. A large, very large, our largest lizard species and the second largest in southern Africa. Okay. Let's pop that down. Our station's Karula crossed south um, just to the east of Shabam Road Junction on Gauri Main. She's left, I think she's left the Bantuan somewhere here. I saw tracks going in around Treehouse Road towards the quarry, but I haven't followed up. Copy that. And yes, Sean, while Karina deposits her offspring in a safe place, it is the natural instinct that keeps them from roaming too far away from wherever she's put them. As they get older, they will roam further and further afield, but not a huge amount. So they'll always be in the general vicinity so that they can respond to her calls immediately whenever she goes back to fetch them. That being said, whilst that natural instinct does act very clearly in the cubs, I have seen female leopards and lions <coughs> turn around and ab I can only describe it as admonishing their little ones. If they keep trying and follow them, They'll actually bat them or hit, sort of smack them with their paw or growl or hiss at them to stop them from following. So sometimes they have to be very firm. Sorry guys, Ephraim is frantically trying to get hold of me. Standing by. Copy that. Thanks very much, Ephraim. I'm probably not going to follow up, but I'm sure she, she could be going to fish those Bantuans from around the quarry. Uh, I'll make my way back towards that area.
copy, thanks. And Ephraim just telling me that um, Thanks very much Ephraim, have a good day. Alright, um, so Ephraim just telling me that the, apparently the guides are reporting that Karula's turned back towards the north and she might be coming back towards Gauri Main once again. Uh, I don't, I think she's just hunting, I think she's just moving around, she won't have caught, well she might have, it's unlikely that she caught something in the time period that from when we've last seen her to now. But it might be worth patrolling the boundary for the last few moments of the sunrise safari and just checking to see whether or not there's any sign of her. Unfortunately, I'm now quite far away from there. I didn't expect her to turn north, but it just goes to show with Karula, you never, never try and predict what she's going to do. So, Sean in South Africa, I do hope that answered your question about cubs and their instincts. As I said, I've seen cats hiss at their cubs to keep them in one place but as soon as she's out of sight then I think that the cubs instinctively relax and stay put. Now what I've been doing is I've actually been checking the spots where Karula has left her cubs before because I believe that they have regular places that they'll leave their cubs. It makes up utmost sense to me that she knows there's certain safe spots and that's where she'll deposit them. Now, it seems to me to make sense that she might do that and also I think for the cubs it's easier for them to stay put if they are familiar with an area which mean, and that in turn will mean they know the escape routes they know ooh. hello boy here you go Gert there was a water buck for you <laughs> And off he goes. Beautiful young bull. Unfortunately, he's almost immediately disappeared. Just the white ring around his bottom disappearing. I'm sure you are all wondering about what step... <laughs> Start that whole sentence again. I am sure you are all wondering what is happening with Steph. Let's go and hear it from the man himself. Not much is happening to me, to be quite honest, and welcome back to our vehicle. We stood by in that area looking for those alarm calls. There's no more sign of alarm calls coming from there. We had a little squirrel making an alarm call and a goshawk flew out of the bush. Now, that's absolutely not what was making the Impala alarm call. I have no doubt that there was some disturbance in there um, that is potentially due to the fact that there's a large male leopard in the particular area. But without more tracks, it becomes quite difficult to say. It all becomes a bit of speculation. So what we've done is just return to our original plan and see if we can't see an area where tracks of that big male leopard come out of this particular block. And basically it's just a hit or miss. It just becomes a patience game. But what I am going to do is take this opportunity to say goodbye, which will leave us with some extra tracking time. If we do find this particular male leopard, we'll absolutely come back and show you in the closing minutes of this particular show. I just want to say thank you from myself, Steph Vinterbould, and from jean Ray on the back of the car. Thanks for all your interesting questions and all the support that you give us. And from my side, at least anyway, for this morning's game drive, goodbye. Have a nice day. Uh, while we come through to the end of our sunrise safari, it seems I've been listening to the Game Drive channel. It seems as though for now, Karula has gone wandering off to the south once again. But as I said, there's a... Oh my goodness! We nearly had a car accident, mister! He's grinning away. He thought that was marvellously good fun. Cheers, guys! Um... Sure. That was quite close. I don't think he saw me there. <laughs> I'm getting out of this place in case there's more to follow. Goodness me. Um, interesting. Anyway, 
Moving on from our near car accident and near death experience, not quite, slight exaggeration, uh, hopefully Karula decides to move to the north at some time during either the middle of the day or during the sunset, safa sunset safari. So tracks are all over here. I've just been looking at them and I know Steph's shown them to you so I'm not going to stop and look again. Go Shamson, who's been listening closely to our guide Linguo and learning re meanings. Mapimpans means little ones, yes, so there's a bit of confusion about what Mapimpans actually means or in fact what language it is, but Mapimpans, yes, baby. Uh, Bantuans, cubs, um, or ba sons, babies, it's not really sons, it's babies as well. Yes, uh, Shkova is a ditch or a dra what we refer to as a drainage line, but it is essentially a ditch. Shudulu is a termite mound. Ah, so one I've caught you out on. Shudulu is a termite mound, but I know why you said that, because I got it wrong on the Game Drive channel two days ago. I called a tree a Shudulu, and I was wrong. And it is not a, a Shudulu is a termite mound, it just, it came out of my mouth faster than I could control it, which often happens when you're trying to present, listen, and talk at the same time and watch the animal. Um, a shlashla, a shlashla actually. A shlashla is a tree or a branch or something similar. So if, if the, the leopard is in a tree, it's in a shlashla. If it's on a termite mound, it's on a shudulu. If it's in the ditch, it's in a shkova. And the leopard is an ingwe. And I really shouldn't be telling you all of this because it's giving you too, far too much insight into all of our secrets. You'll end up giving away a surprise every now and again. But yes, you are absolutely right. Very observant and very well done. I think most of our long-term viewers are starting to, or have actually, pretty much learnt all of the names for the animals and our guide lingo. And apparently we all talk in completely different voices on the Game Drive channel as well. Which is an interesting aspect of our personalities. We go far more South African accent on the Game Drive channel. It is the way forward though. Make yourself understood. All right, well, I'm going to return to the somewhat traumatized main camp and see whether or not the, how the cleanup operation is going. Perhaps attempt to fix the gate. And while we head back across, don't forget to join us for the sunset safari. It's time for us to do our goodbyes and thank yous. So thank you to Gert for his good luck streak A and B, his wonderful camera work, as well as to Rebecca and Lou in final control. And most importantly, a very big thank you to all of you watching across the globe. I hope you've had a fantastic morning drive with us, and we will catch you again this afternoon. Bye-bye, everybody.